Hey, it's Mike here, and today, ubiquinol. In particular, I'm going to be responding to the claim that vegans had 23% lower levels of ubiquinol or CoQ10 or whatever you want to call it. Despite some of you requesting this video, I don't think most people actually know that much about this antioxidant, which is self-generating, and we sort of recharge like a battery. So that's just interesting stuff, period. But really what's going on here is there's a drive by a certain camp to get vegans to feel like they need to supplement this nutrient. So we're gonna investigate the validity of that and just supplements of CoQ10 in general. Look at a bunch of studies on that. Anyway, let's just go. Let's just hop right to that study. Oh wait, we can't because not only is that study not peer reviewed, it is just not available on the internet. I could not find it. Maybe it's somewhere out there in Japanese, but even trying to translate stuff, I could absolutely not find it. Maybe you're a better internet sleuth than I am, but it doesn't appear to exist. But what we do know about the study is from the articles that just regurgitated the same press release, which says that there was 60 people in the study, 30 people that ate meat, and 30 people that were vegetarian or vegan, and then the results were that the level of ubiquinol in vegans was 23% lower. And some articles just make some really overreaching claims like this one, which is just poorly penned in general, saying that vegans had a higher level of deficiency. Deficiency wasn't even in the equation here. And yeah, they even went as far as to say it was, quote, 23% lower than the omnivores as a result of their restrictive dietary habits, which of course implies causation. It was resulting from their diet, which as we know, observational studies cannot determine, especially one this small. But you might be thinking, oh my gosh, this is another study that lumped vegetarians and vegans together. Yes, it is. And I would say because it's in Japan, this is in Asia, like most places, there's a lot more vegetarians than vegans. So chances are it wasn't even 15 vegans and 15 vegetarians. There's probably like five to 10 vegans and then 20 or so vegetarians. And yeah, that exposes that we really don't know anything about the study. We don't know how they chose the participants. Did they match age? Which is really important because the ubiquinol levels naturally go down as you age. There's so many questions. But one question we can't answer is, is there perhaps any bias or just really who did this study? And the result is yes, it is a supplement company that sells CoQ10. And they also appear to have a particular motive to target selling to vegans. Here's from their press release, quote, with Kaneka Ubiquinol, manufacturers of dietary supplements can serve the growing target group of vegetarians and vegans. At least they're being transparent, but yeah, they wanna be selling their ingredient to companies that will target vegans because they know that they buy way more supplements than normal people because they're into health. And of course there are nutrients like B12 that vegans should be supplementing as well. So it all adds up to that supplement frenzy, feeding frenzy by marketers. Anyway, the huge question here above everything else is were these findings even statistically significant? Because if they were not, then no claim can even really be made here. So it's time to get super duper nerdy because I actually whipped out the statistics software for this one. I really just wanted to know, is it likely that if you take two groups of 30 people and you have a 20% or so difference, is that gonna be statistically significant? So I went ahead and I actually created a dummy set of data. I used a normal distribution generator, which essentially creates a bell curve worth of data for each group. I set the omnivores at one and the vegans at 0.77. I had a standard deviation of 10, which I think is pretty tight. I think that's fair. And then the results were, after doing an independent t-test, the confidence interval was from 0.6 to 1.05. That's a 95% confidence interval. And for those that aren't aware, if the confidence interval includes one or that baseline, we can't confidently say that it was a different result from the baseline, which is one. So. There you go, it doesn't seem to be compelling statistically. It's not impossible that they'll release it and they just had some crazy tight or different weird distribution or something and it was statistically significant, but very unlikely. Maybe that's why the study wasn't public because of this. Anyway, let's just get to what CoQ10 actually does because I think it's super interesting. So obviously a lot of antioxidants we eat like the ones in fruit and they buffer oxidative stress, which does damage. But with CoQ10, it's a natural thing in our body. Most of it is created in our body. At least we can get it from our diet and it essentially can be recharged kind of like a battery. And I think this is really cool because I did mention in the past that if you have a lot of chlorophyll in your system, the sunlight can hit that, perform photosynthesis, and then actually recharge that CoQ10 to be used as an antioxidant again, which is awesome. Basically humans can photosynthesize. 
and it is pretty much everywhere throughout our body, buffering the oxidative stress of metabolism. So if you do a bunch of intense exercise, the level will go down. And because it is so ubiquitous everywhere, they of course just called it ubiquinol. Not the most creative scientists out there. And in terms of getting it from a diet, we make the vast, vast majority of it ourselves, but yes, it is in various foods, animal, and plant alike. It's a bit higher in animal foods, especially like meat. For example, a serving might have like three grams, but then if you're eating soy, it might be like half of that in a serving. So yeah, it is fair to say that there's a bit of a higher intake for people that aren't vegan. But we're gonna talk about why the case for that making any difference is really weak in a little bit. All right, now I wanna hop back to this article and what they're using to sort of push that this should be taken. They say, quote, a lack of ubiquinol could lead to fatigue, muscle issues, and a weaker immune system, and it's also a risk factor for many age-related diseases. So we have to zoom out and ask, are vegans skyrocketing in all of these diseases because they don't have enough CoQ10? Well, first of all, let's just look at many age-related diseases, cancer, this meta-analysis, vegans have 15% lower from this study, they have lower diabetes and hypertension, and the list goes on. Weaker immune system? Well, from that recent study that I mentioned, even just loosely plant-based people have 70% lower rates of moderate to severe COVID, so the immune system seems to be doing a little bit better there. How about muscle issues? People would like to believe that vegans' limbs are just like hanging there, flopping, and not working. Well, from this pretty recent study, the vegan group had not only a higher VO2 max, they also had higher endurance, and they say, quote, our study showed that submaximal endurance might be better in vegans compared with omnivores, therefore these findings contradict the popular belief of the general population population. We also have this study that looked at muscle growth on plant versus animal protein matching for protein intake, and there was no difference in muscle growth between the groups. So we have a few options of what's actually going on with vegans and vegetarians versus omnivores here. One, uh, perhaps there just is no actual gap and therefore it's not leading to any differences here. Two, there is actually a gap, but it isn't big enough to make vegans worse off in terms of all of these diseases and muscle things. Or there is a gap and it actually is making a difference, but it's just so offset by other healthier lifestyle factors and antioxidant intake and all those things and blood flow from vegans that we're not gonna see a negative effect from it. Either way you look at it, vegans are doing better or as good in all of these fear monger areas. And you know, we can all fear monger. How about, how about this fear mongering from this study taking these CoQ10 supplements made mice dumb. It literally made these rodents stupider. Ubiquitous. No, it, there's no evidence of that happening in humans, and yeah, it appears to be safe to take. But let's just actually look and see if healthy people should be taking CoQ10 supplements. Like, do they actually help in general? One of the main focuses here, since it's an antioxidant, people ask, is it reducing oxidative stress? Well, to this double-blind placebo-controlled trial, their conclusion is that treatment with CoQ10 in these healthy exercise people did not translate into improved exercise performance or decreased oxidative stress. Fun fact, the study was actually funded by Kaneka, that same company with the original 23% claim, so that is at least a point in their favor for publishing a finding that wasn't flattering. But another important point here is if people who are eating a generally more plant-based diet were failing to get or make enough CoQ10, there would be a lot more oxidative stress in some way that would be noticeable. But no, to Dean Ornish's heavily plant-based studies where you know they're not gonna be getting a bunch of dietary CoQ10, they saw a increase in the length of the telomeres on the DNA, which are those protective caps, which are a basically measure of DNA aging. So how would that reverse if people eating more plant-based would have really failed CoQ10 levels? But all of this got me curious about how much blood levels really would affect things, especially if you were to take supplements, you know, is that actually gonna have an effect on the tissue and organ levels, which are where you definitely need it? This write-up from Oregon State University with 125 references had some good points and they say, quote, under normal circumstances, uptake of supplemental CoQ10 from peripheral tissue slash organs is likely limited because CoQ10 is ubiquitously synthesized. Again, it's like made everywhere. Your organs are like, I already have enough, I got it, I can do this. 
And we also have to put supplements in perspective here because the lower dose supplements like 100 milligrams, which is 40 times that of a serving of fried beef, which is like the highest regularly consumed animal product on the list of CoQ10. We also have to ask, would having that relatively small boost from diet, from eating animal products actually have any effect? Well, Back to OSU, quote, a 2007 review of the literature highlighted that plasma CoQ10 concentrations higher than normal were likely needed to promote CoQ10 uptake by peripheral tissues. So that would actually be an argument for supplementation, but not really an argument that there would be a big difference between diets. And I do want to give CoQ10 supplementation credit where it is due. Yeah, I'm not super compelled by just healthy, normal people, but when it comes to people that are really sick, there do appear to be some positive results here. I mean, people who are admitted to the ICU from this study, well, they say take the results kind of with a grain of salt, the ICU length of stay and the mechanical ventilation duration did go down statistically significantly with CoQ10 and it also appears to be helpful in people with cardiovascular disease as this study mentions. So it's probably happening here is that people who are sick, their body's in a diseased state, they're lacking blood to certain tissues and on and on, and therefore they can't create the natural amount of CoQ10 that their body would create. And that leads to not only lower levels being associated with a ton of bad things, but also how supplementation could help those people. So this makes us ask the question, are vegans so sick and weak that they just can't make enough CoQ10 and that's why it may be slightly lower, although the data is entirely not compelling to me at least. Although the study isn't even released, so how about that? Cash me outside, Kanika Supplement Company or whatever it is. So the nutrient that I see popping up of concern here in terms of making enough CoQ10 is vitamin B6. So we have to ask, perhaps vegans are deficient in this and therefore they can't make enough CoQ10. Well, looking to the studies like this one that I mentioned sometimes out of Switzerland, we can see that, well, the vegetarian group actually did not look pretty good. The vegan group, while not statistically significantly higher, was a little bit higher but the vegetarians were statistically lower, so that is worth mentioning. And then going to deficiency, again, it's the same trend where the, the vegans numerically are best off, but statistically they're the same, and then the vegetarians are worse off in terms of deficiency there. So this is actually evidence that in that original 30-person group, the vegetarians could have just been worse off and the vegans could have been fine, but the total result would still be lower. However, I do have to mention there are other studies showing that no, vegetarians did not even have a worse status of B6. This one went into a lot more detail and didn't find a difference, so... Who knows? We're getting a little long here, but the last plausible theory that I see is totally, totally pulling this one out of my butt, but it's possible that if you have a lower calorie consumption, just because this is an antioxidant that your body makes to offset metabolic oxidative stress, that you would just need to create a little bit less and therefore your levels might be lowered because you need less. Now, vegans and vegetarians tend to eat a little bit less calories. That's totally just a theory. I'd love to see a study on it. Finally, in the end, the main big picture point here is that all of the things that they're trying to scare you about in terms of CoQ10 and why you should supplement, uh, the, the vegans, are doing better in those areas, those age-related diseases, and on and on and on, or they're at least equivalent in terms of things like muscle, but better in terms of endurance from that study I showed you, so looking pretty good. You know, I don't wanna go as far as to say that there wouldn't be any benefits for people generally starting to supplement this, whether they're vegan, vegetarian, or eat meat, but it doesn't look like there's gonna be a result if you are healthy already. But if you do have a disease, like half of the people in the US appear to have coronary artery disease, that means that it could probably help you, I don't know. But I'd love to see a larger, actually peer reviewed, actually published and available study on Western vegans, looking at calorie intake, adjusting for age and all that good stuff. Anyway, let me know down below what you think about all this. Have you ever tried taking ubiquinol? Did you notice a difference? I'm curious. Anyway, feel free to like, subscribe, do anything that helps me because it's appreciated. And thanks for watching. See you next time.